Good morning. It's absolutely wonderful to be here with you. And I have to say, I am so inspired by the video we just watched. And that's a pretty tough act uh, to follow. And I, I want to start by thanking Utah Global Diplomacy for convening us for this important symposium on bridging religious divides and specifically on women's roles in br building bridges across those divides. Uh, and I want to thank them for inviting me. It's, it's truly great uh, to, to be here. Sometimes the world right now is a bit depressing, and it's wonderful to be in rooms full of people who are trying to do something about that. And I have to say, our host organization's commitment to reshaping US foreign affairs by connecting people here and around the world is absolutely vital in this fraught world we find ourselves in in 2024. And I'll just see if I can make this advance. There we go. And, and you see again, I think, yes, the, the women uh, we just heard from. I had to start really by saluting them for that powerful message for their work in the shadow both of the horrors of October 7th and the terrible war in Gaza, which is now spilling tragically across the border into Lebanon. They reminded me of Palestinian and Israeli women I met a little over a decade ago when I was traveling doing research for the book Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here, which is a book of stories about uh, people, many, many women uh, of Muslim heritage and Muslims working against extremism. And I went to Israel and to Palestine at that time and encountered many amazing people trying to stem the tide. Uh, but I'll never forget in particular these Palestinian women who worked with their Israeli colleagues to do something very small, very simple. And this was to get Palestinian children from the West Bank into East Jerusalem, where none of them had ever been able to go, so that they could go to the Palestinian National Theater, the El Hekawati Theater, which is in uh, East Jerusalem. I mean, for many of these children, it will probably be the only time in their lives they go to the theater. Uh, but the teacher who was organizing this had to get special permission uh, to try to take these kids across uh, the wall into East Jerusalem. And a group of Israeli women peace activists, much like Yael, who you just saw in uh, the video, wanted to help them to do this. And so I rode with them. There was an Israeli woman peace activist on each of the buses of Palestinian uh, children trying to get to the theater to enable us to get across the checkpoints. And no one knew if we would make it, if all these children would be disappointed, uh, children some of whom live in difficult conditions in refugee camps. And I'll never forget that moment. Small moment, but we miraculously managed to cross the checkpoints. And cheers erupted on the bus like I've never heard before. The driver put on music. Everyone was clapping and dancing. And there was this magical moment when we emerged into the sort of blinding sunlight uh, and the Jerusalem that shimmers like no other city in the world does. And I have to say, I keep that image, that little moment in my mind when the more difficult and tragic news comes from the Middle East now. And I reflect again and again on how important what those women did, even though it was very small. And I remember talking to a Palestinian researcher on that trip, Mahdi Abdul Hadi, and he had stressed to me that to promote tolerance and to combat extremism, you have to reach youth above all else. And if only for that moment, thanks to those Israeli and Palestinian women working together, the children were in the light. Uh, it was this moment of incredible uh, happiness, and yet we know there has been so much tragedy uh, since. So just wanted to, to share that uh, memory, uh, which the video reminded me of, and I have to say it's beyond inspiring. Uh, after all of the horror in the last year to see that some Israeli and Palestinian women together continued to wage peace. Uh, and that means that we have no excuse to throw up our hands and say it can't be done. So what am I going to talk about in my uh, time today? And there, sorry, I just uh, have to step forward and check the slide. Oh, I can see there. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm from the 20th century, so I'm looking the wrong way. 
So we're living in an era characterized by a resurgence of dangerous international armed conflicts, all of which have a terrible impact on women in many regions. According to the 2024 Global Peace Index, we're actually witnessing the highest numbers of countries involved in conflicts since the end of World War II. Think about that. Think about the responsibility a moment like that gives us. There were 162,000 reported conflict deaths last year. There were 47,000 conflict deaths just in the first quarter of this year. And the, pink, the peace think tank Vision of Humanity warns us that if the same rate continues for the rest of this year, it will be the highest number of conflict deaths since the Rwandan genocide in 1994. So this is a moment for us to reflect very carefully on what we must do together uh, to respond to that. Many of these conflicts are facilitated by, exacerbated by diverse forms of fundamentalism within many of the world's great religious traditions, tying these problems together of extremism and conflict. And I think all of this explains why of late we're hearing many experts stress the need for an increasing focus on conflict prevention in women's human rights discourse. Maybe something we haven't spoken about as much recently. Uh, and so I think this is another reason that our topic for today is especially timely. It's no accident that at the same time we're seeing a global backlash against women's equality, and we're also witnessing extreme repression of women's rights in multiple contexts that we are told are technically at peace. I'm gonna talk about one of those in some detail. And we're seeing, sadly, that the international community is failing to adequately address these problems. So there's never been a more important time for women to wage peace and to do so in a holistic manner, tying all of these elements together. So when I started thinking about what I wanted to say today, I realized that for me, the key question is, what does peace mean for women? So what would a, a peace that takes women seriously, as I call it with a pun intended, a piece of her mean? I think we need to highlight also what women have done to build that peace on the front lines, and then what we must do, what's our responsibility internationally to support them. So these are the questions that I'm going to address this morning until I run out of time, uh, drawing from my own research and my own experiences and interviews that I conducted with women human rights defenders around the world. And as you see in the outline, I will conclude with a particular focus on what all of this means in light of the current women's rights catastrophe in Afghanistan, uh, which is something I've been working on a great deal in the last three years. So let me start by explaining my perspective on these questions. It's always nice to know where is this speaker coming from. My perspective has really been shaped both by personal and professional, oops, wrong button, there we go, personal and professional uh, experiences, and I will share a few of those. So my own family on my father's side is from the North African country of Algeria and was gravely affected by two armed conflicts in the second half of the 20th century, my home century. The first of those conflicts was Algeria's War of Independence, which of course is legendary, from 1954 to 1962, during which as many as a million Algerians were killed by French colonial forces, including my grandfather and two of my uncles. And my grandmother, Kamisa, who you see here uh, in the picture with some of my cousins, uh, she survived that war, but she was gravely wounded and the family home was destroyed, which of course had a terrible impact uh, on her. I think about her a lot uh, when I do this work. Unfortunately, there was also another conflict which affected the Benoon family uh, in the 20th century, including my father, who you see here, uh, Mahfoud Benoon. Uh, and this was what Algerians call the dark decade of the 1990s, when the forces of armed extremism, the sort of precursor of uh, ISIS, uh, the so-called Islamic State, fought against the Algerian military in a quest to take power in the country, which thankfully did not succeed. And many Algerians, uh, like my dad, spoke out 
very vocally against uh, those extremists. Uh, and my father received death threats for years for doing that. But many women were also uh, resisting the extremists, as you see uh, here. In both of these conflicts, as I learned, women were targeted in many ways. They suffered deeply. And at the same time, they played constructive roles in ultimately defeating both colonialism and then later on fundamentalism. And meanwhile, uh, the struggle for women's rights in Algeria remains outstanding and ongoing. So this has very much shaped my own view of these issues and I think this is why I spend so much time working in this area. So my family history brought me to my current line of work. I'm now a professor of international law, and I was a UN special rapporteur uh, working on human rights issues around the world. Much of my academic writing in recent years has been in the genre of what's known as feminist international law, uh, which gained prominence uh, particularly since the early 1990s and recognizes, uh, as you see in the quote uh, here, that the structure of the international legal order reflects a male perspective and ensures its continued dominance. So when we think about women waging peace, that is part of what they are up against. And sadly, this assertion from these leading feminist international lawyers from 1991 remains true. Now, there has been some important progress since then in putting these issues on the international agenda, the adoption of a series of Security Council resolutions on women, peace, and security, the recognition of violence against women as a human rights issue, and there's been progress on the so-called mainstreaming of women's human rights. However, the backlash against all of those advances has been accelerating also. Uh, here at home in recent years and around the world. And it risks really eroding and undermining those hard-won advances. So I think it remains essential today to consider the feminist international law commitment to reintroduce the diverse perspectives of women into international relations. And I'm so grateful to see this conference today aiming to do just that. I've tried to take this commitment of listening to women's voices to heart, and so a lot of my scholarship has involved doing something professors of international law don't always do, which is field work. I think it's no accident my father was an anthropology professor. I have done a lot of interviews with women human rights defenders, including in regions affected by violence and conflict and extremism. This has included uh, regions from the Caucasus to the Middle East to West Africa and beyond, some of which I will reflect on in a moment. And I think listening to frontline voices is critically important. So it's all of these experiences, personal and professional, that have shaped my view of what it means for women to wage peace. In the UN, I should note, there has been an entire body of work on something called the human right to peace. I don't know that we talk about that often enough. However, one key outstanding challenge has, to be, has been to bring clarity and meaning and inspirational appeal to this sort of war-weary idea of peace. A piece of her, as I described it, has to include both what's been called negative peace, that is the absence of conflict, as well as positive peace, that is the presence of the necessary conditions for peace and for society to flourish. The latter is understood by experts to include respect for human rights. So human rights, women's equality at the heart of positive peace. But too often it is only negative peace that is on the international agenda. As important as that is, not alone, not by enough uh, by itself. So the UN General Assembly, and here I'm sorry, I'm having my first formatting problem. I cut and pasted this uh, many times, but I will share the text with you. I'm sorry that it didn't come through there. The UN General Assembly's 2016 Declaration on the Right to Peace asserts that everyone has the right to enjoy peace such that all human rights are promoted and protected and development is fully realized. Now this right is not specifically defined in the text, but it's a kind of amalgamation of rights to human security, to development, to a sustainable environment, and to respect for international law norms about peaceful resolution of disputes. 
This right to peace is primordial, and it is vital to securing all other human rights. But it has to be imbued with more than platitudes to be meaningful in women's lives. It has to be a right that actually offers a remedy in situations that pose grave threats to women's lives and women's equality. And I will say that on the basis of my work with women from Afghanistan and many other countries, I've learned that any meaningful peace has to include an unwavering commitment to women's equality. It must go hand in hand with a commitment to the robust protection of women's rights. This perspective is actually reflected in the language of UN Charter Article 2, Paragraph 3, which tells us that all members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. And I think it is important not to forget that little clause about justice. I remember what an Afghan women's rights advocate wrote back in 2010. Uh, she decried what she called short-termist approaches to peace in the context of her own country which she frames specifically as a threat to justice. And unfortunately, she has been proven exactly right. In fact, Article 1 of the UN Charter, which sets out the purposes of the UN, puts both the maintenance of international peace and security and the achievement of human rights without discrimination on the basis of sex explicitly at the core of the UN's goals. The preamble to the UN General Assembly's Declaration on the Right to Peace itself recalls that the full and complete development of a country, the welfare of the world, and the cause of peace itself require the maximum participation of women on equal terms with men in all fields. And it goes on to stress that states need to respect, implement, and promote equality and non-discrimination as a means to build peace within and between societies. Uh, and I think the fact that the script is not showing up here is actually a good metaphor for the disappearance of these ideas all too often in our discussions about peace. So I'm just going to take it uh, for that rather than a technical glitch. Now, one key place where the issues of women's rights and waging peace intersect is the lack of representation of women in the military and in its leadership around the world. So what we see is that actually everywhere, most soldiers are men, not to discount the contributions of those who are women, but most of them are men, and especially most of those who serve in combat functions. And there's a very interesting book written by an anthropologist named Joshua Goldstein called War and Gender, and he examines international evidence relating to the participation of women in combat literally across human history, and he argues that in fact far fewer than 1% of all warriors in history have been women. So uh, I think the kind of gendered nature of warfare is something we need to think about and unpack and address. And Goldstein argues, I think quite eloquently, he says, killing in war does not come naturally for either gender, yet the potential for war has been universal. To help overcome soldiers' reluctance to fight, cultures develop gender roles that equate manhood with toughness under fire, unquote. His words remind us that the struggle for peace is actually closely related to the efforts we need to make to undo the gender stereotypes that are also an obstacle to women's equality. Even as they are underrepresented in military forces, war at the same time then has a disproportionate impact on women, and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action coming out of the Fourth World Conference on Women reminded us that civilian victims, mostly women and children, often outnumber casualties among combatants. So given all of these realities then, what does peace mean for women on the front lines around the world? I've learned so much from this, uh, for, about this from speaking with Afghan women on repeated human rights missions to their country since 1996. And given their bitter experience, I've found they tend to have a very holistic approach to peace. For example, I interviewed the former parliamentarian and women's rights advocate Fauzia Kufi uh, back in 2011 at the parliament building in Kabul when the country was still a flawed but constitutional republic. Uh, and I asked her about 
the meaning of peace and what a peace agenda should look like, and she insisted that equality and safety of women had to be at the heart of any meaningful uh, peace. For most of us, she said back in 2011, as if she could predict exactly what would happen 10 years later, for most of us during Taliban times, and here she means back in the 90s, that was not a peaceful situation because peace means you need to have social protection. It is not only open war and killing each other that is war. There is also war of minds because if you are not relaxed at your home and if you are afraid at any time that the Taliban will come and accuse you of something, then that's not peace. Peace is beyond the issue of military war. It also has to be social peace. And I have thought about this again and again since 2021 when the Taliban returned to power. So negotiations are a form of peaceful dispute settlement grounded in international law and encouraged by the UN Charter. But negotiations can have ambiguous consequences for women as Afghan women have seen when those on the other side of them deny women's equality and when women are not fully included in those negotiations and when their rights are reduced to a bargaining chip. As the US government began to look to negotiations with the Taliban in the early 2010s when I was in Kabul, uh, something which became, I have to say, a bipartisan approach, uh, and they were you know, really looking to working with something that was being called the moderate Taliban, a senior US official openly said to the Washington Post, gender issues are going to have to take a back seat to other priorities. There's no way we can be successful if we maintain every special interest and pet project. All these pet rocks in our rucksack are taking us down. And when you hear those words, you realize it is no accident where Afghanistan ended up because the gender issue was put in the back seat and here is the result of that. So that's maybe a bit of a sad moment. I wanna to turn to some, some positive examples here of the kinds of things women have done to really push back. And it's not just in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I have traveled around the world talking to women who have found the most creative ways uh, to fight back peacefully against extremism, against conflict, in situations when you would have thought it would be impossible uh, to do so. And these women taught me that the struggle for women's rights and women's equality are not sort of side issues or add-ons. They're essential components of achieving uh, peace, and certainly they are absolutely central to the goals of defeating extremism. Uh, I'll never forget this woman, a sociologist uh, named Zainabu Hadari from Niger, which has, of course, experienced a terrible uh, coup uh, since that time. And she said to me, every step forward in the fight for women's rights is a piece of the struggle against fundamentalism. I know she was right. And I think her words are relevant to our topic today as well. Uh, and so to echo her, I would say every step forward in the fight for women's rights is also a piece of the struggle for peace. I also learned that conflict and repression don't, just cannot stop women human rights defenders who respond with creativity and commitment. Uh, and this is happening all over the world, and I have to say my emphasis on uh, Muslim-majority regions of the world has to do with my own research uh, interests and my own uh, background, but you could give examples from many other parts of the world. Let me just mention a few of these women. I, I interviewed uh, women from Nigeria. Here you see the Bring Back Our Girls uh, movement, well known. What was less well known was the work of Nigerian women as Boko Haram, the extremist group, was on the rise in their country to counter the efforts by uh, fundamentalists in Nigeria to try to impose cruel punishments like stoning and flogging on women. And I interviewed a woman named Aisha Imam, who was the founder of an organization called Baobab for Women's Human Rights, named after, of course, a renowned local tree. And she told me about her advocacy against those punishments applied to women in the name of religion. And she and her colleagues would go village by village, working at the local level, working closely with women, with village heads, with religious leaders, to convince people that appealing sentences claimed to be pronounced in the name of God is not anti-God, 
that they had the right to appeal. And what's amazing is that every single one of these stoning sentences in Nigeria was ultimately successfully appealed with the support of these women's human rights defenders, resulting in acquittals or at least non-performance of sentence. Uh, and as I said in my book, in the battle between stone and tree, it was the baobab that prevailed. Uh, and again, I think another example of the tremendous creativity uh, and fortitude that women have shown in uh, organizing and really struggling for a meaningful uh, peace with women's human rights at its heart. I think of those Algerian women that I talked about in the 1990s who would go to the site of terrorist bomb blasts the next day and fill them with flowers, who would be out, as you see in this picture, protesting in public against the killings of male intellectuals, uh, who would take their children to school when extremists decreed that studies should stop. And I would say they did as much to help defeat uh, armed extremism uh, as the use of force uh, did, and with much less cost uh, to human rights. Uh, and I'm going to jump forward because I have so many stories and I love telling stories and I could keep doing this uh, for a long time. Uh, but I just want to move on because I want to make sure we have time for the discussion. But I wanted to mention something that this Malian woman said to me, which I think is critically important for our conversations here all day today. So this is a Malian lawyer named Saren Keita Diakite. And I went to see her in Bamako back in December of 2012. And you have to remember, this is a time when the entire North north of Mali was occupied by jihadist armed groups who were imposing really cruel uh, form of rule on local people. And I remember what this Malian woman lawyer said to me. There were virtually no foreigners in Bamako at this point. She said, international solidarity is very helpful. When you live such a crisis alone, it is much more difficult to bear. And so this event today, and hopefully the reflection and action that it will cause to support women peace builders on the front lines is absolutely essential. It can really make a difference in helping them uh, be able to continue their work. Uh, and with that, I wanna move uh, to really focus in detail on the current situation uh, in Afghanistan. So what has happened uh, now that women's rights were put on the back burner, uh, that the Taliban returned uh, to power? The country has basically become the crucible of women's rights in 2024. The predictions of all of the Afghan Cassandras that I interviewed a decade ago about the consequences of a shallow approach uh, to peace have sadly come true. And I think one of the best ways for me to explain this would actually be to stop talking. You're wondering why I'm doing that. It's because Afghan women, many of you know, cannot speak in public now. It is against uh, the law actually decreed by the Taliban uh, for women's voices to be heard speaking or singing in public. This is one of the latest uh, measures, Orwellian measures taken uh, under what's called the law on the promotion of virtue and prevention of vice. Of course, the amazing thing is what happened. Immediately, Afghan women defied this in a very courageous uh, campaign of posting uh, videos of themselves on the internet, singing, sometimes reciting uh, the Quran, reciting poetry, and there's even been a, a small but courageous campaign of particularly young women going out and sort of clandestinely singing in public and videotaping themselves uh, doing this and, and putting that uh, on the internet. So really a reminder that Afghan women human rights defenders are in the lead tackling uh, this human rights crisis. But again, at the same time, they say again and again, they're in grave need of that global solidarity and support that the Malian lawyer uh, told me was so essential. So there are more than 100 decrees now against uh, women's rights. Uh, Afghan women have been stripped of literally almost every right. You may have heard Meryl Streep say uh, earlier this week that in Afghanistan now a bird has more human rights, uh, more rights than uh, a woman because a bird can sing uh, in public. Women have lost their rights to education, to work, to health, to freedom of movement, and to take part in cultural, political, and social life. And this has all happened openly 
in ways that could be described as de jure, that is, it's the official policy, and in plain view of the entire world. And the question is, what is the world going to do about this? We see many statements condemning what is happening in Afghanistan, and yet we also see governments and even parts of the United Nations system drifting towards various kinds of normalization of the Taliban. Uh, most recently, the UN bureaucracy willing to hold a meeting in Doha uh, with the Taliban with no Afghan women present and without Afghan women's rights even being on the agenda because that is what the Taliban insisted on. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the part of the UN system was willing to go ahead uh, with this. So one of the worst parts of all of this is that we're then told that this is peace, right? You'll hear journalists again and again say, there is now peace in Afghanistan. And it's certainly true that uh, some of the horrible uh, civilian casualties in the suicide bombings of uh, the last uh, decade before the Taliban took power aren't happening, but that's because the terrorists are now in power. That's not peace. Uh, and so uh, I think we really, every time we hear that assertion that this is a form of peace, uh, we have to push back. One of the ways that Afghan women have been doing this is with some of the artwork uh, that you are seeing. Uh, another way is to characterize what is happening to them as gender apartheid. Uh, so analogous to racial apartheid uh, in South Africa. Uh, so women being systematically uh, relegated to segregation, excluded from public spaces and spheres, systemically oppressed, uh, treated as being not as human as men. And one of the great things to see in the work on gender apartheid, which I've been very involved in for the last couple of years, is the great support that Afghan women have received from a number of prominent black South African uh, feminists who know better than anyone else what apartheid uh, means, who lived through it, who battled apartheid. And we're actually frustrated that the gendered aspects of apartheid were not given adequate consideration in their own uh, country. Uh, and so I think the support of some of those women, like Penelope Andrews, the first black woman dean of a law school in South Africa, uh, has been critically important uh, in these efforts. And you see here now what we're trying to do is actually codify a prohibition on gender apartheid alongside the prohibition on racial apartheid uh, in international law in a new c convention on crimes against humanity. Uh, and even as someone as prominent as Grasa Michelle, the widow of Nelson Mandela, has been supporting Afghan women uh, in these efforts. Um, but there has also been tremendous pushback uh, on these efforts, in particular from states who do not want to be told that they have to set limits on how they engage with the Taliban, because part of the reason that we want to use this gender apartheid uh, framing and that Afghan women have been calling, this, uh, calling for this so strongly that in fact some of them have undertaken a hunger strike uh, to achieve recognition of this concept is precisely that it provides guard rails against normalization. The point of apartheid law was to get the rest of the international community to act in a con concerted way that respected international law, to put pressure on the apartheid regime, and to end that form of government. Uh, and now we are seeing governments want to be able to normalize the Taliban, unfortunately. Although I shouldn't generalize here because there are 10 countries from diverse regions, Australia, Brazil, Malta, Mexico, the United States, Philipp the P Philippines, Chile, Iceland, and Austria that have all proposed codifying a gender apartheid, possibly in the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. And there are other supporters of this project, uh, one you may recognize uh, here, and that's the Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai, who uh, devoted her entire Nelson Mandela lecture in South Africa on the 10th anniversary of his passing back in December to the topic of gender apartheid in Afghanistan, garnering lots of support from prominent South Africans and representatives of civil society. And I think the key message of uh, gender apartheid is that rule like this cannot possibly deserve the name of 
peace. This is not a peace of her, if that is what we are committed uh, to building, and we should be. So what does all of this then mean for waging peace? Clearly, in the views of all these Afghan women human rights uh, defenders that I work with, that I've cited, the right to peace, if it is to mean anything, must mean a right to a just and equal peace. It must include dignity, equality, and security for women who are no one's pet rocks. It must be comprehensive. Going all the way back again to the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action adopted in 1995 by the Fourth World Conference on Women, we were told that peace is inextricably linked with equality between men and women. And we cannot let that message be erased the way that it was on my slide. Because a piece of her has to take that assertion seriously. A piece of her also has to reflect the need to end all forms of gender-based violence. The struggle for a right to peace and for that right to actually matter in women's lives will be, first of all, about how we define that peace. Uh, and I, as I'm wrapping up here, I, I have to go back to the words of another Afghan woman I interviewed back in 2011 in Kabul. This is a woman named Alia Yusufzai. And she was in the office of her organization, which had run clandestine schools during the first Taliban rule in the 90s. Uh, and she told me all the way back in 2011, she told me the international community is just talking about political peace. But we are working on social peace. Our peace building unit is working on conflict management, conflict analysis, and peace building. Because sometimes people say they're trying to bring peace, but they are willing to sacrifice a lady. So we are covering women's rights and human rights. Because maybe otherwise there will be peace among men, but they will have sacrificed women. This version of peace she criticized in 2011 that was then realized in her country 10 years, this limited peace among some men is not the peace to which international law should codify a right. Unlike Alia's peace and that of Afghan women human rights defenders, it is not a piece of her. Their peace, her peace, is the one to which humanity should aspire in the 21st century. The time for women to wage that peace is now, and I sincerely believe that with our collective unwavering support, even in these challenging and polarizing times, someday soon, they will achieve it. They will achieve, as the video said, as Yael said in that video, a history change. And I will leave you with the words an Afghan woman said to me in 2011 when she was in a terrible security situation, even then. She said, optimism is key to survival. Thank you very much, and I wish you a successful meeting. We've covered a lot of ground. And I can imagine when I look out, on this, out in this room, I'm trying to step into your minds and in your hearts. And, and think about maybe some of the questions you have. I wanna go back to the beginning of your presentation. You talk about a piece of her as having a genetic component. You attribute the women who came before you. You attribute the men who came before you. The, everyone here has an, ans an ancestry line. Everybody here has women and men that they're connected to either by blood or by claiming them as our family. On a very personal note, can you share with us some of the, the pieces of your ancestors that you feel have empowered you to do this work as a woman? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I can think of a number of them. One is my, my Algerian grandfather, who was the head of our village. So my father is from a peasant, was from a peasant background uh, from the mountains of northeastern Algeria and a small traditional uh, community uh, under French colonial rule at that time when my, my dad was born. And he, I never met my grandfather, of course, because he was killed during the War of Independence. But my father told me stories about him. For example, my grandfather made the decision, and it's a difficult decision rural families have to make, uh, that not all the children could go to school uh, because some children had to stay home and work with the livestock and so on. But my grandfather decided, rather than keeping all the girls home and letting the boys go to school, 
that half the girls would stay home and half the boys would stay home and half the girls would go to school and half the boys uh, would go to school among his children. Now, of course, it's tragic that any of the kids uh, had to stay home, but this was a reality of rural village life at that time. And that, to me, was just a, a reminder that you have to understand the context in which people are operating and recognize the steps forward that they're able uh, to take in that uh, context. So that, that's a story that, that always uh, stayed with me. Another story that stayed with me uh, comes from my father. So my father fought in Algeria's War of Independence. Uh, he, well, he, he didn't actually, he was a liaison officer for the independence movement and he spent uh, about four and a half, five years uh, as a prisoner of war. And he told me that it was when he was a prisoner of war that he started to think critically for the first time about the situation of women in his country because his status came to really be the same as theirs, deprived of his liberty. And that always stayed with me. I actually talk about that at the end of the paper that I wrote um, on gender apartheid. That's wonderful. So here's our first action item. We at Bell International, and I know certainly with Utah Global Diplomacy, we want this to be an action-oriented conference. We can talk about the issues, but if they stay in this room, they mean nothing. So I think you've really modeled the first action item, which is you should know where you come from. You should know who you come from. And you should study your ancestral lines to understand the stories and traits that make you who you are as a man or woman in this work. Particularly for women, knowing where we come from can then be the source of strength that we draw upon to carry us into the future. So there is your first invitation. So after you talked about your history, Algeria, these critical moments, women going out, into the streets. I loved the image of women planting flowers at those bomb sites. I started to think, again, some of the women in this room have a sphere of influence that allows them to go to bomb sites. Some of the women in this room may not see their sphere of influence the same way. I do not want to discount anyone's sphere of influence. What happens in your home is as important as what happens at a bomb site. But maybe you could outline this or give us some tangible ways that women in this room can both viscerally and metaphorically plant those flowers. What does it look like in the United States? What does it look like in the Western United States? You don't have to speak to Utah specifically. But what could the women in this room do to take similar actions of those stories you told us about? That's such a great question, and that's one thing that really heartens me. So many places I go and I talk about these issues, and the first question people ask is, what can we do? I think there are so many people of goodwill uh, trying to figure out how to have a positive impact. Uh, I have a few ideas, but I'd also love to hear uh, your ideas. I mean, one idea, one idea is really something you're already doing here today, uh, but maybe to sort of internationalize it even more, uh, and that is to, to bring women uh, from some of these contexts to speak here, uh, whether it is physically or virtually, which we're able to do now, to work to get what they are writing translated. I mean, the, the reason I wrote this book about people organizing against extremists is I was so frustrated that the extremists have a huge microphone and no one listens to the people working against them. Somehow they're not a big story. Everybody, if they knew anything about uh, the terrible events in Algeria in the 1990s, they knew about the terrorists, but they didn't know about you know, those women filling the bomb craters uh, with flowers. So working to try to make sure those stories are told, that there are books in your local library uh, about those kinds of uh, stories. Uh, travel, uh, but you have to follow your gut on when it's safe and not safe to do that. Uh, solidarity delegations, I think, can be very powerful. And also 
fundraising for some of these women's peace building groups on the front lines. The extremists have a huge source of revenue, but the people peacefully opposing them uh, don't. And I, I remember I went to a place in Algeria when I was writing my book, which was the sort of most gravely affected by extremist violence in the 1990s. We called it the Triangle of Death, if you can imagine. And in this place, uh, a women's group had set up a sewing club for women who had survived that violence. And it seems like a really small thing, but it was a place for those women to go uh, and just talk about what they had experienced or be together as they were trying to rebuild their lives. And it was so meaningful to the women to, to have that space. And while I was writing the book, before the book came out, and I, was, I had this whole chapter about how wonderful this was, they had to shut down for lack of funds. And it was a really small project that didn't actually need that much funding to survive. Uh, so I think looking for opportunities to provide uh, actual tangible uh, financial support, sometimes in very small amounts, uh, micro grants uh, even, uh, can make a significant difference. But I would also love to hear your ideas about how to take this forward. So there's a few more action items for you. Books and libraries, translating, if you're a writer, translating your materials from other languages or into other languages so that it's not an English-dominated conversation, connecting with women in other parts of the world, solidarity trips, fundraising, micro-grants. That's, that's a great list. We're building a pretty robust toolkit, and I'm excited to use it. My last question, so if any of you would like to ask a question, I invite you now to start lining up. My last question for you is thinking about where you ended your presentation, that is Afghanistan. I'm, I'm losing sleep on this issue. I think women who follow the topic closely feel the same way. We will have a new president in several months' time. I'm not gonna talk about who or what that could mean, but let's, let's just fast forward into the future. It's January. The new administration comes into the government of the United States. What can we do to mobilize that administration and signal to them that women's issues are on the agenda and that we care about Afghanistan, we care about other parts of the world, and we will not stay silent? That is such a great question. Um, and I think this is really a bipartisan issue. I think both of the two major political parties in this country unfortunately failed uh, collectively and together on uh, this issue, deciding that they could make something that would look like peace in Afghanistan without uh, Afghan women in the room, without even the Afghan government uh, in the room. And now I do think there are elements in the government that would be very happy to at least to some degree normalize the Taliban uh, with some uh, conditions. Um, I think one of the problems is that we have a sort of definition of terrorism, uh, that it is the violence that affects Westerners, and so if that's not happening, you know, then violence that affects uh, Afghans and diverse forms of violence is somehow tolerable. So I think we have to make this a bipartisan issue. I think we have to challenge uh, both parties, whichever uh, party takes uh, the White House, on this issue to put Afghan women back at the heart of the matter, to consult them thoroughly on uh, Afghan uh, policy, and to take principled uh, positions, not to participate in all you know, they're largely male envoys at meetings with the Taliban where Afghan women uh, are not in the room. Uh, to pressure uh, the Taliban to release imprisoned uh, Afghan women human rights uh, defenders. Uh, to pressure the Taliban uh, to lift these awful more than 100 decrees restricting women's rights and to make clear that you know there will not be business as usual with them. They will not have a seat at the table as long as these policies remain in place. We have to be uh, very vocal. We have to invite Afghan women uh, to, to speak. I'm so grateful to Meryl Streep uh, for what we did, anybody for what she did, anybody who has a platform needs to use it uh, to support them. Uh, they've been silenced at home and we have to make absolutely sure their voices are heard here. Great, so I'm hearing from that, um, 
one thing Bellwether could do to get all of you involved is perhaps we could sign a letter together saying that as the concerned women of the Utah Global Diplomacy Network, we would like to make sure that Afghan women are part of the new administration's foreign policy priority. So Felicia, if you'll please put down a note with my name on it, let's draft that letter. We have your email addresses. Around, about and around January of next year, when you get an email from us on this issue, please sign it, distribute it, and let's make sure we take the conversation we've had here to the White House. So now turning to you for some questions. It's the least we can do. If you have a question, please stand up to the mic. I'm actually gonna run the mic around, so if anyone has any questions, I can take it to you. Okay, we'll start here. Julia, please. Hello, um, I have a comment and a question, and I will be um, actually speaking later, so early hello to everybody in the room. Um, I have worked in Afghanistan for five years. I was involved in the evacuation. I was involved in that peace deal. I would challenge your portrayal of negative peace and that peace deal. The reality is, is that President Trump and President Biden responded to a deeply felt need of the American people, a bipartisan need to get out of Afghanistan. The reality is, is that both of those administrations pursued to the best of their ability a peace deal to get out of Afghanistan in response to a popular surge in demand to exit that war. That base level, at the local level, democratic demand on two presidents to exit that conflict had to be responded to. That is one thing I would just add to this conversation that I think is often forgotten. From my perspective, on that peace deal and on the conflict and on this whole topic of normalization, in 2001, the Bush administration had the opportunity to strike a deal with the Taliban. They chose not to do so because Taliban are too evil and beyond the pale to engage. That mistake continued into 2011 with the second failed peace process with the Obama administration, and it was the Trump administration that did strike a deal with the Taliban. Since that deal, since the withdrawal, it is true that, uh, that there have been recent steps towards engagement with Taliban. However, I'd also note the policy has been no engagement with Taliban over years since 2021, and they are only getting more extreme. I'd point to many conflicts around the world where the same exact policy of no engagement has continued without any change. North Korea, for example, for decades there has been a policy of no engagement because we don't want to admit them into the global community. Right. Guess what? No change. Yep. Cuba, no change. Iran, no change. Cutting people out of the global community is a failed way to change their minds. Yep. Thank you, Julia. I, but let me, let me get to my okay, point. Okay, briefly. Thank you. How do you look at that long track record of failure to hold authoritarian regimes accountable through not engaging? How do you, how do, I guess I'm genuinely asking from your perspective, what's the game plan here? Because are we gonna be sitting at a table 10 years from now saying we can't engage with Taliban and they're still gonna be in power? If this community doesn't engage, the only community that will will be people who don't at all care about women's rights as we've seen previously. Thank you so much. We're gonna take two more questions and then we can address those. So the first, non-engagement, Julia, thank you. Such a critical point. We'll take the question behind here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, I, I don't know the lady. Julia. Yeah, Julia, sorry. Thanks, Julia, for such a great question because technically my question is the same. What is the play, play game here? because I'm from Iran. I see everyone talking about Gaza, Palestine, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan. No one mentions Iran. And it is, we say Iran, but you guys say <laughs> Iran. And whenever people say, oh, you're from Iran, and I would say that, yeah, Iran. <laughs> you know, because technically, there is no policy, absolutely no policy, for Iranian people. We see Iranian people here, yes, but mainly the policy actually protects 
the terrorist government of Iran. All governmental people have like citizenship here. They have all the rights here. Even the president, the, late, the latest president of Iran, President Raisi, I hope you know his name, he was killed by Iran government itself because of some local issues. But anyway, he was a terrorist and UN actually hold a memorial for him. And it is like, I'm sorry to say it, but the world is sort of a failure for Iran. Mm -hmm. And the funny part is that we talk about all these problems, but we never look at the root of these problems. Right. And the root of these problems are technically, if you eliminate it, these problems eventually will disappear. And we all gather here saying that nothing should stay here, which is awesome. But at what level, at what extreme, it would actually go to the policies? Right. Thank you so Thank much. You. One more question. Um, this man here standing. We can also take some additional questions during the break, but for the sake of time, and I know we need a break, we'll just take one more here. If you could keep your comments brief, please. Thank Good you. morning. My question up front. Um, to meet, Af like you said, Afghanistan, bring it up from the bottom, right? Involve it at the base level. Um, how do we change it from the top? And I know that's a small ask. Uh, 17 years in the Utah National Guard, uh, been to, I'm a French linguist, and I've been to many of those French colonial areas. So I, I can relate and I appreciate your presence. I had no idea your depth history, depth, excuse me, history of depth. But how do you suggest we change that? Because being a member of the Guard, there's only like 17% of the women in the military. So I invite more people to come and join and change it, right? Go to the inside. But from the top down, how do we meet that bottom up? Thank you so much. So with a little summary of, of the questions, Julia's critical point that there was under two presidents a democratic urge to pull out of Afghanistan. There has been some change to the climate. How do we think about that? And then the second part of her comments, non-engagement with autocratic governments, failure, a history of failure, critical points. Thank you, Julia. To the woman behind you, if you could please remind me your name. Mina, talking about Iran. And I think what you're pointing to, Mina, is also just the poly crisis. When we talk about Afghan women, Iran women, Israeli women, how do we hold space for multiple crises? How do we take action? And then finally, the, the uh, National Guard, where, where do you go? The, uh, what's your name? Rob. Rob, thank you, Rob, for your service. Speaking about top down, how do we change systems? I think all three of these questions really tie nicely together. I'm sure you're gonna solve all of the problems in the next five minutes. So I'll give you a chance to respond, I'll share some final thoughts, and then we'll move into our break. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for these questions. I think these are conversations we have to be having. I think it's especially important in these times to be able to disagree and have different views and talk our way uh, through that. So I appreciate the first uh, question from a critical perspective uh, very much. I myself have a very different view, uh, as you've already heard, uh, and I would say a couple things about that. One is that the point is not no engagement of any kind. The point is principled engagement with red lines, listening to Afghan women human rights defenders and what they are saying about what forms of engagement are and are not helpful and acceptable. For example, not taking part in all male meetings about Afghanistan in the current circumstance. We saw it became very chic to send these all male delegations, everybody from the ICRC to governments uh, was doing this. So very important to have women in the room, both uh, foreign women, international women, and Afghan women. Uh, critically important uh, also uh, to not engage in ways that show tolerance for uh, gross 
abuses. And I think there are many critics who look at that Doha 3 meeting that happened recently where the UN was willing, and I understand the UN is in a very difficult situation, and this is part of the UN bureaucracy, but the UN was willing to have a meeting with the Taliban, with no Afghan women in the room, with a sort of side uh, meeting of Afghan with Afghan women in uh, a different venue, and to not put women's rights on the agenda. And I think it's no accident that then only a short time later we see the Taliban impose a whole new set of restrictions to the point of banning women's voices in public. They saw that green light uh, and they moved forward. And and I think you know. <laughs> We struggled with this in Algeria in the, in the 1990s when the government and the armed groups uh, would negotiate because what the country then experienced is in those times when there were negotiations with the extremist groups, actually the violence by those groups against the civilian population went up considerably. Uh, and so you have to think carefully about the unintended consequences uh, of engagement and what engagement looks like. And it is also interesting to go back and look at the South Africa comparison. You will remember that South Africans themselves who were countering apartheid wanted a strong stance against the apartheid government from the international community to the point of sanctions on their own country. You will remember that some governments, in particular in the United Kingdom and the United States, instead wanted something called constructive engagement with the apartheid regime, and the entire international legal system rejected that. And it was the firm stand that apartheid is unacceptable as a form of governance in the modern world, coming from the international level, but also in synergy with and led by and guided by the frontline activism against apartheid that made the change. And I think we need to see some of the same principled uh, commitment now, but most importantly, we need to be guided by diverse Afghan women human rights defenders uh, in how we go about this. So you know, that's a long discursion. I realize I haven't even begun to really address a very complicated question, uh, but, but I, will, I will stop there on that question. Um, on, on Iran, uh, I think maybe it was more of a statement than a question, which I, I welcome. Uh, and I realize I didn't talk about Iran in this particular talk. I was just at an Iranian studies conference in uh, Germany about a month ago, uh, run by a wonderful organization called uh, Iran Academia, which is a collection of Iranian academics uh, in exile. And uh, I heard some papers from wonderful young women academics from Iran uh, talking about their work, uh, field work with Iranian uh, women about and young women specifically about the impact of uh, the hijab law uh, on them and, and the meaning for them uh, and, and what it means uh, for their ability to enjoy their human rights. Uh, and I am very worried that uh, since the, the women life freedom demonstrations uh, began in Iran, we have forgotten about those struggles. And we seem to have a very short uh, attention span. Uh, and I am really worried, based on work that I did when I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Cultural Rights, that the human rights situation is going to gravely deteriorate uh, even further uh, now in Iran. There are some young women uh, who are uh, activists who are facing uh, death sentences. And even though Iran is not in the headlines, and, and you're absolutely right, other issues are in the headlines uh, now, we have to find uh, ways to keep those stories prominent in people's minds and just kind of dovetailing with the previous question, one thing that I've done a lot of work with Iranian human rights defenders, and one thing that they are often frustrated by is that when they try to raise human rights issues in Iran here, uh, they're sometimes told that they're sort of getting in the way of peace with Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, you know, finding a diplomatic resolution to all the outstanding conflicts between the United States and the Iranian government, that's, that's a, a laudable and important goal. But human rights in Iran also has to be uh, the heart of that enterprise, and we have to listen to the voices of Iranian human rights defenders and not shut them out of the conversation. Um, and I think I may have already addressed the, the synergy of the uh, top down and um, the bottom up, but feel free to come back to me if I didn't. But I realize we're short on time. Yes, we are. So let me just round out with some thoughts here. Um, 
when you are facing a poly crisis, women need to do a couple of things. The first is that we're going to have to hold space for each other. We're going to have to hold a lot of tension inside of our bodies, inside of our homes, and inside of our societies. And when I say it's tension, it's tension because there's not easy solutions. And so just as all bodies reject trauma and pain, we reject tension. And when we reject tension, we tend to put out of our mind the things that are urgent. Hold the tension and learn to create peace from the inside out. Learn to create peace in tension. And if we can do that as women, then I think we'll be able to hold space to say, Iranian women are suffering. Afghan women are suffering. They're not mutually exclusive. We could spend the next hour listing all the other women in the world that are suffering. Let's hold a special space for those women and give each other grace when we don't list every group that is suffering. We can hold each other to account and remember that in our hearts we are thinking of them as women, as part of the family of mankind and womankind. The second thing I'll point to in a poly crisis, it's, it's hard to think about prevention when the house is burning down. But prevention is how we're going to get ahead of the curve on these autocratic issues. Governments that are putting these policies in place can't put them in place overnight. They can't put them in place in a year. If they're really effective, they can put them in place in two years. But that means while we think about Iran and Afghanistan, we also need to think about where we should prevent conflict from unfolding. This, these two things can happen at the same time. So for all of you multitaskers out there, this is best case scenario. When we stand up and advocate for women's suffering now, we're preventing suffering in the future. But we also need to orient and remember a conversation that I had with one of the first women who ever worked for the UK Federal Reserve, their, their national bank. She went on to, to work in the top uh, departments of the World Bank, truly a woman trailblazer. I was speaking to her one time as an economist, which is my training. I said, please tell me, we're doing so many good things all over the world. Which is more important, preventing or responding? She said, the most important work you can do is preventing a bad thing from happening because you can never anticipate the cleanup. So prevent the bad things as much as you can, even if it goes without recognition, and learn to hold the tension of peace inside of you so we can lead this movement forward for all women everywhere in every country. Thank you.